Uh, so this is John Madden. I'm the director of trauma for Paragon 28. Uh, apologies as my camera is not working, but wanted to go ahead and and introduce our faculty presenter uh, tonight. We have Dr. Alexander Emerald. Um, he currently practices at Premier Orthopedic and Sports Medicine in their Pennsylvania Orthopedic Center division um, in both the Malvern and Collegeville, Pennsylvania locations. Alexander Emerald is also fellowship trained at Broadlawns Medical Center in Des Moines, Iowa, and he did the Foot and Ankle Trauma Reconstructive Fellowship. And he's also a College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons and part of the American Board of Foot and Ankle Surgeon Lead Program, which is the continuous certification program as an in-training exam board questions item writer. Um, he's heavily involved in scientific research and presented on several topics, including total talus replacements, Achilles ruptures, ankle fractures, and Liz Frank injuries and fusions. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Alexander Emerald. The floor is yours, sir. Uh, thanks for having me at this talk. Um, I hope uh, we can all take some uh, good information from this lecture. Um, so, you know, Liz Frank fractures, um, you know, we all know about them. Uh, we know how difficult these can be with um, surgical itself but also the, the long-term sequela and kind of how to address this. There's been countless literature on this uh, in the last 10 years. There's literature every single year published. There's multiple different ways to address these. And I think the problem is, is that addressing these, we can't just categorize all list franks as just one, uh, one injury. So we'll talk about some, some things, a little bit of literature, but also a lot of examples on kind of how we address certain things. So, you know, I think these are kind of the agenda topics for the talk. We're going to uh, be understanding the challenges involved. We're going to talk about the surgical techniques and approaches to fix these. We're going to talk about the Paragon 20 Gorilla List Frank plating system, along with other uh, systems they have to help um, you reduce and fixate and treat the patients with List Frank fractures. And we'll go through a plethora of case examples to talk about certain ways to, to fixate these. So, you know, List Frank fractures, you know, you know, what do we know about these injuries? We know that these are really uncommon. So some people can be in practice 10 years and never even see a single one, maybe a low energy one, but really uncommon injuries. They're only 0.2% of all fractures and they're, and they're, if they're missed or diagnosed, they can lead to pain, poor functional outcomes, and also chronic disability. So we know that the fourth and fifth TMTs of the lateral column are the essential joints requiring mobility and absorption with uh, impact and walking. And we know that the medial columns, so the first, second, and third TMTs, are non-essential rigid joints, which assist with push-off strength and maintain arch port, uh, for, uh, posture, but um, really just not essential. They're rigid. So, you know, what do we know about the injury patterns with these? We know this trauma of sports, they can be, the injuries can be pure ligamentous. They can all be bony combination or combination of both. They can be variable fracture patterns. Um, they could be low energy or high energy. Um, these come along with soft tissue problems and or compartment syndrome. Um, here are just some examples of list frank fractures I've seen uh, over the last uh, seven years of practice. You can see the patient on the left, significant soft tissue compromise, compartment syndrome. Now we're dealing with the skin incisions that we have to address. You can see on the right, there's a low energy list frank um, with widening of the uh, second med base and the medial canary form. And you can see a high energy with multiple comminuted fractures and uh, uh, dislocations and um, uh, misalignments. So these are all still considered less frank, but they're really essentially very different injuries. So, you know, understanding the challenge of these is the key. You know, you may need to um, address multiple weight these fractures in multiple different ways, whether it's K wire fixation for sta temporary stabilization, whether it's minimally invasive screw fixation, plate fixation for. Um, uh, bridge plating or fusion or multiple plates to address certain deformities to get these things healed and aligned in a better position. So, um, you know, again, what do we know about how to how to address these? So ORAF remains as possibly the most accepted uh, treatment, um, but we know certain things about ORAF that painful osteoarthritis and likely possibly a conversion to arthritis is often required. So Primary arthrodesis can be ad advocated in certain cases, um, and there's no current consensus on choice of fixation in the literature. So when we talk about understanding the challenges with these, um, 
we need to kind of really understand specifically um, what are our options. So, you know, is there really a clear clinical surgical consensus? And there's actually literature to support all the hardware and all their approaches. And if we kind of really think about it, you know, there is either a primary fusion or an ORAF. Um, and when we talk about primary fusion, what do we really think about when do we perform a primary fusion? We, we generally lean towards all, all these types of injuries. So uh, comminution, neuropathy, increased BMI or obesity, high energy trauma, older patients, or even um, uh, workers' compensation. These are kind of been detailed as primary fusion cases. This is kind of what we're taught in, uh, in, the, in, uh, in school, in residency, um, and sometimes even in practice. ORAF, we usually reserve for minimal to no comminution. An athlete, you may want to perform an RIF. Low energy trauma can be really amenable to an RIF on our young patient. So, and all of these arrows on the left, when I talk about the hardware, K wires, solid screws, cannulated screws, plates, bridge plating, suture buttons, all have some documented um, literature on these are uh, possibly accepted ways of fixing these. But what is really the end result? Um, and what is really the key to addressing them? And what is a uh, most optimal surgery. Is there an optimal surgery? So, um, so, you know, and again, when we talk about understanding the challenges and I always kind of want to make these statements and I think this was really good from what I learned from multiple lectures. And I always want to say is what we think or want to think or what we know or think we know about these. So when do we fixate the list, Frank? Lower energy, younger patient, minimal comorbidities, we want to talk about this really big statement, and it's very similar to kind of almost all fracture fundamentals, uh, p one fractures, ankle fractures, other different injuries of uh, upper or lower extremity, reconstructable fragments with larger fragments of articular surface. These are pieces you can put back together um, to maintain the articular alignment. Or also fractures less than three weeks old. These are kind of ways where I would think we want to fixate the, fix the list, Frank, as opposed to fusing the list, Frank. When do we fuse the list, Frank? Higher energy injuries, older patient, lots of comorbidities, non-reconstructable fragments with extensive comminution, so small pieces and multiple pieces where we can't put back together, and also fractures more than three weeks old. So we're going to talk about, are these really true statements, or this is what we think are true? So when we looked at ligamentous injuries, and it was a randomized prospective study. This was the article that was published in 2006 that everyone knows, uh, 41 patients, uh, three and a half year follow-up. They did basically uh, 21 primary orthodesis and 21 RIF with screws. Um, the prior, the primary orthodesis group had four hardware removals. The RIF group has 16 hardware removals and five patients had fusions by three years. So what they learned from primary ligamentous was that um, in RAF, 65% returned to preop activity, but only, and then 92% returned uh, to preop activity in arthrodesis. So arthrodesis is much better in a pure ligamentous. So this really was a big article published, and um, it's still really quoted today in all the literature. So when Henning looked at an open reduction compared to primary arthrodesis and less frank injuries, another randomized study in 2009. They had 32 patients that had a two-year follow-up. They had 14 ORF and 18 primary arthrodesis patients. And they found that in the ORF group, 11 patients had to get their hardware removed and primary arthrodesis only had to get three hardware removed. So they found really no differences in the, how the patients did, but the biggest staggering difference was the removal of hardware, so second surgery. And we'll talk about you know, why is second surgery even bad? Is it even, um, uh, is it even dangerous to do? So when another article from McGill looked at um, open reduction term fixation versus primary arthrodesis, um, another uh, systematic review as well as a meta-analysis, they found 187 patients with acute frank injuries. These are acute injuries. Follow-up was very good. It was uh, over five years. And the results demonstrated that an ORF was associated with significantly higher need for revision surgery and a higher rate with persisted, persisted pain compared to primary arthrodesis. So they found that the primary these did much better than an RIF. So when we also compared an arthrodesis to a non-fusion, so RIF to treat list frank uh, fractures, this article out of Canada looked at 25 patients, 17 did RIF, eight did primary arthrodesis. So again, 
mostly we see more RRF than primary arthrodesis in his articles. And they found the statements that they made that showed primary arthrodesis had reduced foot deformity rates, reduced complications, higher levels of functional recovery, shorter time of surgical procedures intraoperatively, and also higher scores. So the patients did better with effusion. So, you know, this article in 2017, I really believe changed my practice. And I kind of really go by based off of this. And I felt like um, I kind of almost practiced based on this article. So it was really important at Foot Ankle International. And it looked at primary arthrodesis versus open reduction term fixation of low energy list frank, which are much more common, and young athletic populations. So this is an army. Um, they looked at low energy list frank in the military population. They had 32 patients, so not a lot, but the average age is only 28 years old. And these are high level athletes. Um, primary arthrodesis was done of 14 patients. RAF was 18, so very similar. Um, they found that primary arthrodesis returned to full duty at 4.5 months compared to RAF, which was 6.7 months. And at one year, the primary arthrodesis group ran their fitness test nine minutes slower. So they weren't nearly as good, but almost very close to their per mile standard than their preoperative, where the RAF was actually 39 seconds slower, so much worse. And the hardware removal was staggering, 15 out of 18 in ORIF, and then only two or 14 in primary arthrodesis. So the same kind of statement can be made. If you do an ORIF, the hardware really needs to be removed because it's symptomatic. So when we understand the challenges of this, if you look at all the articles published, and there's even more articles, there, there are dozens, fusion is definitely favored in, in a couple of different regards. Um, and the one necessary need is the hardware. So there's a much less need for hard, what, hardware removal and also less continued pain with effusion. So long-term RAF and primary arthrodesis have similar results, but you should know there'll be a second surgery. So, you know, when we kind of understand this, and, and, and again, I don't want to make a statement that fusion is the only way to go. I think this is really the other viable option. Um, and this article looked at temporary bridge plating with locking plates. And there's a 34 patient study uh, follow-up was 49 months. They had 21 patients with bridge plating, 13 with K-wires or screws. They found that in the transarticular group, which is basically screws across the joints, they had to get a hard removal at 10 out of 13 patients. Uh, implant removal is almost all guaranteed as well in 17 out of 21 bridge plating group. But they found that people did worse for the transarticular group than the, um, uh, the bridge plating. But the satisfaction scores were 90 percent of bridge plating, but eighty percent are transarticular. So still, still both good, but much better with uh, transarticular. And the slide on the on the top right, the one with all the colorful circles. So you can see the two holes created by the screws or the wires placed. But you know, sometimes we're not the best surgeons. We may need to throw a wire or a screw multiple different tries to get in the alignment of the reduction that we want, um, unless we're superstars, which not everyone is. Uh, I'm not. So if you look at all those holes created, I mean, you're creating pretty significant damage to the to the articular surface of the joints. So you really need to be careful when we're doing transarticular screw fixation. So this is kind of the article where I wanted to cite back in 2019, where I looked at the deep nerve injury following hardware removal for list frank injury. So the rate of deep peroneal nerve injury from a primary list frank fusion was 11%, but when we did a routine hardware removal that was already planned, the overall rate of nerve injury rose to 23%, so double. So when we take out hardware, there can definitely be um, some nerve entrapment or scar tissue or even damage to a nerve. So, you know, kind of based off this previous slide, what, what is my typical preference for addressing West Frank? And I, I'm really mostly primary arthrodesis with these. Um, and RAF is really isolated in a low energy or uh, a young patient, really in the PEDS. Uh, pediatric patient. Um, I, I typically perform an RAF with with uh, hardware removal, but uh, I'm mostly primary arthrodesis. I'm I'm pretty much majority of these. So when we look at the surgical techniques and approaches, there's multiple different ways to approach these. There's multiple different articles that talk about a single modified incision from the dorsal foot to address all three first tarsal metal tarsal joints, the first, second, and third. Um, there's also a two incision or a three incision approach to get to the lateral corner, as well as a centralized incision over the, the second uh, tarsal metal tarsal joint with extension distally uh, with a straight medial incision. Um, so there's both of them ways to approach it. All of these had good 
uh, outcomes and approaches with uh, with uh, statements. But my preference typically when I perform these surgeries, if there's uh, multiple uh, tarsal middle tarsal joints involved, I do a straight medial approach and I make an incision at the medial edge of the third tarsal middle tarsal joint. That allows me to still see the first um, um, a lateral aspect of the first tarsal middle tarsal joint, as well as the actual West Frank complex, as well as the second and third uh, tarsal middle tarsal joints. So I think this can be done really safely with a wider skin bridge. And I've been very good with these incisions for the last uh, seven years. So when we kind of look at West Frank in general, you know, there's multiple different things we have to address. So this is a really nice publication from an article. And they looked at what does a surgeon look at when we're actually taking x-rays of these list franks. So you can see we want to look for the, the medial corner of the, of the wedge of the second metatarsal base. We want to look in the contour of the first metatarsal on the oblique view. We want to be looking at the lateral edge of the third tarsal metatarsal joint and also look at the list frank. Um, to see if there is a reduction. We want to look at the lateral view to make sure there's no elevation or step off of the second or first tarsal middle tarsal joint, as well as make sure that the fifth med base is in appropriate alignment on the lateral view. So there is a lot going on with the list, Frank, and your mind really needs to be thinking on all different aspects. So, you know, again, kind of going back to the original statement, um, when do I fix the list, Frank? My, my, my criteria really is low energy, um, I usually do isolated um, list frank screw or intercaneiform screw, uh, younger patient, uh, minimal comorbidities. And if there are larger pieces of fragments that are in the surface that can be reduced and I can maintain the articular surface, um, if there's across the joints, especially in a pediatric patient uh, or really young age and low energy, I'm more of a bridge plating. I, I almost never do transarticular across the joints unless it's the list frank joint. Um, other than that, I, I tend not to put screws across the joints. Fractures are less than three weeks old. These are these are when I fix these. When do I fuse these? Um, the threshold arguably is very low. Um, I think I mainly fuse most of these. Um, nowadays, I'm really age independent, barring pediatric. Um, I've done fusion on athletes on all the different kinds of ages, and they've actually done very well based on the literature. And we're not going back in and doing a second surgery. I've yet to take out anyone's hardware. And I'll show you kind of what my approach is with these um, to minimize hardware prominence, uh, reproductive, reproductible results, um, and reproducible results, as well as um, keeping a lower profile. And then also um, negating a list frank screw in a fusion. Um, we'll, we'll show you some of the results where it can be really be maintained. And there's no hardware that we're routinely need to come out. So when we talk about the, the Paragon 28 Gorilla list frank plating system, there is a plethora of options. Um, I really do believe it's a, almost a self-encompassing system that has any option you want. Um, there's uh, six unique plates. There's 32 plating options. Um, I really, really like the second and third um, tarsal middle tarsal uh, plate, um, especially with the, the eight hole with the two compression slots. Um, they're small and medium sizing, and those really kind of encompass the joint. If you're really looking to do bridge plating or intercanadian form instability, um, across the, the, the West Frank complex. The first and second dual ray plate is excellent, um, as well as the, the, the six hole plate um, with the four hole and the two compression slots with a smaller second tarsal and a tarsal joint for bridge plating. Um, you have straight plate, slanted, clover. There's multiple options. And also if you're dealing with small bones in a thinner patient or you need multiple plates to stabilize multiple fractures, there's an additional uh, baby gorilla plating with a point throw options. And then the mini monster screws, they're solid and canoid screws. So you can have uh, two, five, three, oh, four, oh, uh, solid screws. So um, I think there is a significant amount of options and opportunities for this. Um, again, you can see here that it's really an excellent option for an RF or primary arthrodesis. Um, it's really excellent for bridge plating. It's also excellent for intercaneiform instability. You can see the picture on the right was of a patient I did with a primary arthrodesis. So um, really, really good options uh, with these plates um, in uh, in uh, all types of list franks. So, you know, this was another case I did where I utilized the um, uh, the list frank plating system. And this was actually a shark or reconstruction where there was significant tailor navicular dislocation and malalignment as well as an AP and lateral abuse. And we did um, a straddle plate in the medial side with a medial column uh, beam. And we did a CC joint arthrodesis as well as a second and third tarsal metatarsal joint arthrodesis uh, with that plate. And you can see a really nice contour 
on the plate with um, external alignment. And there's multiple options um, for positioning and screw fixation. You can put two screws in the uh, intermediate lateral container form as well as two screws in the middle tarsal to span uh, that joint. And uh, I think it really works well, especially you can see in that middle picture and the oblique, this really nice contour on the plate. Um, especially if you position it well, um, I think you you really like it if you use it. So, you know, this is kind of how I started doing uh, with Frank surgery. You can see that um, I almost never do a percutaneous reduction on these. Um, I typically do a mini open approach. I make a small incision over the list Frank complex. I make a small incision for the medial side. I, re I reduce the fracture dislocation on the list Frank, and I put a screw across the list Frank. And then again, uh, hardware removal comes out of four months. And I felt like I was, I knew what I was doing, um, but I really didn't like that second surgery. And you can see that incision, you know, going back in, to, to, if you had to put a plate dorsally, again, deep uh, nerve injury, uh, I really were worried about that. So, you know, you, you can see another combination of a list, Frank, um, uh, low energy. Um, like I said, low energy, young person. This was a young kid that's 17 years old. The other girl was... 16 years old, pediatric. I perform an ORAF, like I said, uh, plate fixation to stabilize the metatarsal fractures that were displaced laterally and dorsally. We did a list frank screw to reduce the, um, the gapping in the list frank complex. You can see there's an excellent reduction on the AP and lateral views. And again, screw comes out usually at four months. Um, again, second surgery, um, didn't really like that. So then it's hard to say myself, okay, uh, ORAF has an option. I think fusion, as we know from the literature, is the way to go. You can see this is another example I had with a high energy, uh, less frank, uh, medial and lateral dislocation, dorsal elevation of multiple metatarsals. Um, I performed the primary arthrodesis of uh, first, second, and third tarsal metatarsal joints. I was using a less frank screw at that time. The patient did well. Um, I had no issues. But again, that less frank screw, you know, um, it's a tough throw. There's a lot of hardware in the way. Um, it can be really difficult um, with all these plates and screws. So I so told myself, hey, this is a tough surgery to get that screw across. Um, it's, there's got to be a better way. So um, again, kind of said, okay, well, uh, I'm going to start keep fusing these. The patients were having good results. You can see another example of a list frank or lateral deviation of the metatarsals. Um, patient had pre-existing bunion. We didn't address that during surgery. We did a primary arthrodesis of the first, second, third tarsal metatarsal joints with uh, alignment anatomically. I was happy with the result. Patient did well. Um, I, I, I told myself, hey, these list frank screws are tough to throw. We're going to put an intercanator form screw. Uh, I did that for a while. I said, hey, I think I know what I'm doing. I think the patients are doing well. Um, and uh, so far, so good. You know, same kind of example, another list frank uh, fracture dislocation, uh, medial deviation of the first uh, tarsal metatarsal joints, elevation of the first metatarsal, significant comminution. Same thing, we did three plates and said, hey, I'm not going to use uh, any more screws across the list frank complex in a fusion. I stress these uh, in surgery to check for intercaniform instability. If there's no intercaniform instability, I just do three plates. And I said, hey, I'm having good results. I'm not having any issues with the list frank. I don't need to put any uh, synosmotic, I'm sorry, any uh, list frank screw across the list frank complex or intercaniform with the fusion. Um, another example, you know, you can see here the picture initially I showed you, uh, really bad list frank, very bad soft tissue. Um, I said, hey, in these stage approaches, I'm going to put pins in to stabilize these fractures, let the soft tissue calm down, and then address these. Um, this patient actually never even followed up um, um, until so late, and the pins were put in. I actually pulled them in my office, but the patient did really well. This is the same patient from before where the wires were kept in for roughly um, eight weeks. He just literally never showed back up, which was uh, really abnormal in, in my patient population, actually. But he did fantastic. All his wounds healed. Um, we did close his compartment syndrome sites uh, approximately, I believe, a week after uh, or less five days after. But you can see uh, really stable on the lateral view. He has some slight widening on the list rank complex, but everything is really healed. Um, so it made me wonder, is like, hey, like this, are pins actually better? Um, but in, in this in this situation, it was very unique. But um, you can see it really, really uh, patient did uh, pretty well with, without even any fixation, just K-wires. So another example of a really bad list, Frank, with dorsal subluxation of the uh, tarsal metatarsal joints. Um, you can see the medial canary form is straight medial and the, the, all the foot's going lateral. 
Um, same thing, temporary K-wire fixation to stabilize if the patient did not have any compartment syndrome. Uh, I felt good about the reduction. I did a prime erythrodesis. Um, I did use an interfragmentary screw with a plate, and then I started using staples. I told myself, hey, I think staples are going to be better. They're quicker, they're lower profile, and you save a lot of time. Patient did functionally very well uh, with no complications, and it was, it was really happy. So, you know, another example, I said, hey, I like these staples. I'm going to start using more staples. Um, you can see another bad list, Frank, from lateral deviation of the second metatarsal base. There is um, a significant elevation of the uh, medial canary form. There's also this really bad medial canary form and um, navicular uh, instability um, in, in the joint going medially. So if you kind of see that, um, I really do believe you need to kind of span these injuries. So I performed a fusion primarily as well in this patient where I did plate, staple, and screw. I did a screw across the base of the first metatarsal, across the base of the second metatarsal. Um, again, you can see no list Frank screw. Patient did fantastic with no complications, um, and um, he, he was happy. So I, I told myself, hey, these are rigid joints. Um, they don't have a lot of movement, um, and they keep your arch height, and you can see the patient is very, very stable. So uh, I told myself, hey, there's got to be something to these staples. Some, something is definitely working here. So another bad list, Frank, open. Um, the medial canary form was completely outside the, the, the bone uh, uh, and displaced and into the skin. Um, significant lateral deviation of the metatarsals. Um, you can see that the medial canary form is in bad shape. Uh, we did temporize the patient with K-wires and went back into surgery and did a prime erythrodesis. And this time we did a medial column. Uh, we can see staples across, screws across the medial canary form. Um, as well as uh, two plate fixation across the, the uh, intermediate canary form and the, and the base of the second metatarsal, as well as spanning that really bad fracture um, and uh, really uh, really bad uh, comminution from the uh, navicular into the base of the third metatarsal. Uh, patient did fantastic as well. She was really low demand. Um, you know, I think she had a, a really really didn't have the best looking feet to begin with. And then um, you can see on the bottom right side, this is one year post op. Uh, really, really stable foot, um, no valgus collapse, um, and everything fused. And again, I said, hey, there's something to the staples. And you can see there's really no list Frank screw as well. So I started thinking to myself, if I'm doing primary arthrodesis, why am I thinking about putting list Frank screws? This Everything is a very rigid, stable column there. So um, another case example, uh, really bad list Frank, um, significant um, dislocation of the navicular you know, can we still categorize this as a list Frank? Again, like we told you before, these are low energy or high energy. This is clearly a high energy MVA. Um, and you can see it really, really bad. We put the patient in X fix, he had compartment syndrome. Uh, reduction really was difficult to get the navicular back, but everything came out really well. Um, patient ended up with um, significant skin compromise, had to get a free flap. Uh, we had really one shot as soft tissue, or else um, there really is no second surgery for this gentleman. We did a primary arthrodesis of the medial column with a plate and staple fixation. Um, we, the CC joint was completely dislocated. His uh, whole medial column was dislocated. His uh, list frank complex was dislocated. So we did a primary arthrodesis. And unfortunately, uh, we made him a pretty rigid foot, um, but he still has a foot and it's, it's still functional. I, um, he was a med student um, at the time, actually. He did go back to his all his clinical rotations at about well, one year. Um, he still talks to me from time to time. He's actually going to ortho which is really, really, really nice to hear after what he went through. So um, I think uh, he's going to have a, hopefully a bright future. So, you know, another example of that case I presented with the um, Paragon 28 uh, plating system, you can see really, really excellent results. You can see intercuneiform instability is really essential between a second and third um, cuneiforms. You can see plate fixation. Everything is a really well alignment and well positioned. Um, and I think these have a really good role for, for plating these, um, um, especially if you're doing a fusion or, or bridge plating. So, you know, I started out with plate fixation. Um, you know, I was having good results. I was always worried about uh, timing, uh, soft tissue, pro hardware prominence, and also hardware removals. I knew that if we took out too much hardware from time to time, there'll be some deep peroneal nerve injury. We know there's a there's a over 20% chance, especially with a second surgery. So you know, is there a reproducible way to address these? So this was a low energy list, Frank. You can see on the MRI, this patient had a 7.6 millimeter gap over a list, Frank. 
and low energy, 30 years old. We did a primary arthrodesis with plate fixation. I'm sorry, with a staple fixation. And you can see that we didn't use a intercuneiform screw. We didn't use a list frank screw in the patient. This patient right here was um, about uh, six months post-op. Uh, excellent results. Uh, no uh, nerve irritation, no hardware prominence. Um, and you can see really stable list frank complex. So I kind of really reverted back to, to doing these surgeries with staples. I think that if there's um, low energy, there, there is not significant comminution, um, which is majority of these list franks that most of us will see unless it's high energy MBA type injuries or sports. I think there is a significant role for using staples for these. And you can see multiple examples on the bottom. This is really my preference. I stress the list frank complex. If there is a list frank, some instability I see, I put an intercaneiform screw from the medial caneiform into the middle caneiform. Uh, we know that those screws never break, especially in bunion surgery. So these are not going to irritate patients um, and is not going to need to come out. And you can see all these examples are really far out from patients, almost a year out, some of these uh, with, with no issues. And you can see, again, my preferred technique is uh, staple fixation. I do a straight medial incision and that same incision or the lateral edge of the um, second uh, tarsometatarsal joint or the medial edge of that third tarsometatarsal joint. And you can have access to the lateral edge of that uh, first tarsometatarsal joint uh, very easily with, with, that, with that incision over the dorsal aspect. And you can see as a plates or screw combination, you can see all the, some of these have intercaneiform screws um, if we need to, if there's some instability, but otherwise um, these patients can do really well with this type of construct. So, you know, one thing I wanted to briefly mention is that Paragon has um, the new staple fixation for, it's called the, the JAWS Great White Staple System. And I did have a, um, a use of it just the other week, and I want to put this in. Um, I think there's these are excellent, a low profile, extremely easy to use, extremely quick and reproducible. I think if you're addressing these with tarsal metal tarsal joints, you're really looking at the 15 to 18. If you're looking at the first, um, you're really looking at the 20 or 18, the medial side, and then the dorsal lateral side. You really should be thinking 18 or 15. Just keep in mind the legs are 20 in the medial side. So if you think that it might be too long um, into the uh, intercaneiform joint, so you may want to uh, go down to an 18. But dorsally, it's always really 15 or 18. So um, you can see an example. One I did, we did this for a um, arthritis of isolated second tarsometatarsal joint that failed um, conservative treatment. And you can see here that we, we basically isolate the joint. We free up the cartilage. Um, we then um, drill the two pegs. We put temporary uh, peg hole wires in there. Uh, you can see in the, the middle bottom image where the two pegs go in. You can see the staple going in with the mechanism to deploy. All you do is push that tab and you pull up. Um, it's there. You, you can tap it right through the, the drill guide. And you can see really low profile, uh, really easy uh, surgery. The surgery itself took less than 15 minutes. Um, you can see um, if you're doing a list frank fusion, um, especially in low energy, um, you can really get the surgery done in, in really about 30, 30, 40 minutes. If you're doing plate and screw fixation, there's a, there's a much more x-ray, uh, much more, much more, um, uh, much more radiation. And also you're, you're taking much more measurements. These are, these are quick and easy that you can safely do um, at a surgery center or hospital. So what I want to kind of uh, mention about Liz Frank and understanding kind of everything involved, it can be a really challenging pathology, and there, there's a significant debate on fixation. There's difficult, usually soft tissue, and there's a variable fracture patterns, and no one is really almost the same. Uh, we know that hardware removal and RF would likely be necessary, and there's a chance that it can increase deep nerve peroneal injury, so keep that in mind. Um, primary orthodesis provides excellent results with lower need for hardware removal. Um, the plate fixation is ideal for multiple intraarticular joint involvement and intercaneiform instability. Uh, but my preference in low energy is, is really a fusion with staple fixation with um, added uh, intercaneiform screw, but no less frank screw needed. And these can be really be maintained uh, long-term. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Emerald. We've got a few questions for you. Um, I don't know if you can see the question. I can just read it to you if you would like. Yeah. So we got Charles from Philadelphia, not far from your neck of the woods there. So Charles asked, what is your talk track when speaking directly to patients? 
um, if you're presenting fusion versus ORIF, you lean on the data and research, or is it simply leading the witness sort of into that direction? Yeah. So um, I, I usually tell patients, you know, hey, this is this is a, a injury that's going to take a long time. They're depending. It's really depending on really the pathology of the list frank. How bad is the list frank? If it's an isolated list frank, low energy, um, no comminution, just that gapping with a small uh, flex sign, or just a base fracture of the second metatarsal uh, base, um, I tell them, hey. If we do an RRF on this, um, and sometimes you do an RRF, it's just low energy, we try not to put any more hardware. Um, from there, I, I tell them that they may need the hardware to come out. And if you do, uh, the hardware comes out, there may be an, an issue with your skin um, and the nerve. So uh, do I really lead the patient into a fusion? I generally tell the patient that this is likely, if we do a fusion, we will eliminate your chance of arthritis down the road. We will generally perform a one and done surgery. Um, and I tell patients, if we fuse these joints, like we do in bunions or corrective osteotomies for, um, um, for metaductus um, in, in a fusion, um, you really, your function of your foot will not change much. Um, and the patients functionally do better. So, I do kind of lead them in, but I think all doctors kind of lead into patients on the treatment they think is best for them or society as a whole. So the answer to your question is, is I usually present both options, um, but I tell the patient openly that I'm heavily favored into a fusion. And if that was my foot or my family's foot, I would go to a fusion. That's great feedback. And that, that actually, um, comes from um, or leads into the next question, which I think you kind of answered, but I don't want to, you know, make any assumptions. When doing an ORF, do you let patients know there's going to be a possibility of removing the hardware in the future? Uh, definitely. So if it's a younger patient um, and there's multiple joint involvement, and uh, typically my preference for, for that type of low energy, younger patient, if I really don't want to sacrifice, especially in pediatric or really under the age of 18 is my consideration. If we do uh, just isolate a list frank screw, uh, I do tell them that um, there'll be definitely a very high possibility of a hard removal. And it's almost guaranteed that we will remove the screw. Um, if there is a interconnect form and a list frank screw, both those screws usually come out of four months. If there's two, if there's a plate put in uh, or bridge plating uh, for the medial column and uh, uh, dorsal, um, the dorsal aspect, I then say, or just straight medial, um, I definitely tell them the hardware will definitely come out. Um, I usually do it all about four months, um, almost never sooner uh, unless there's a problem. But um, the good news is um, if I do a fusion, there's almost no need for a hard removal. So, Okay. Um, another question. Um, can you talk a little bit about your joint prep? I mean, what, what exactly do you use? Do you use a burr? Do you use a saw? Curettes? We have like the sure. honey badger tool on our set. It's pretty nice, but not uh, sure how familiar you are with, with that nice tool. Um, go ahead. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So I use that, uh, honey badger all the time. Um, you know, excellent. uh, the, the step drill is, uh, is, is excellent. Um, so what I typically do is I use this tractor to open up the, so my typical approach to a list Frank, especially during a fusion, I first stabilize the medial column. So I'd open up the joint or use a curette to remove all the non-viable car car uh, cartilage. And I use the honey badger, to fenestrate the uh, articular surface. I reduce the first tarsal metal the tarsal joint. I take x-rays and the AP ladder reviews to make sure there's no elevation of the joints. We're not trying to plantar flex. This is not doing any bunion surgery. So we try to stabilize the medial column. Then I fixate that with a straight medial staple and then a dorsal lateral staple. And then um, at that point, I go. I work from uh, medial to lateral. So I address the second tarsal metal tarsal joint. And what I typically use is I use a microsagittal bone saw and I just take out the cartilage. So just really a sliver off the base of the um, second metatarsal and the distal aspect of the, of the intermediate cuneiform. I then typically I would reduce the list frank with a point of reduction clamp and you can really reduce it extremely well. And with that clamp there in place, um, you can definitely still put a staple right there. Um, and if you're dealing with comminution, you can definitely um, reduce the list frank by taking the clamp 
Um, and I prep the second and third, if there's a third tarsal, middle tarsal joint pathology, and I prep all the joints first, and then I reduce everything. So I take the point of the clamp and I clamp it over a third, reduce the list, Frank. I take my thumb and make sure there's no elevation. Um, and then I position the plate or staples, whatever I need to do. And then I temporarily pin them utilizing thread the olive wires. And then I just put screws in um, after that. The good news is when you're dealing with a second or third tarsal and a tarsal joint, um, you know, you can definitely, um, you know, you know, probably don't need the honey badger for those smaller joints, but, um, you know, you don't need a ton of compression uh, across those lesser tarsal and tarsal joints. Um, I do think they fuse as long as they're together. There's not much movement there. And you're, as if you're fusing them, um, the compression stable is excellent. So you can earlier weight bear these people. But if you're using a plate, I mean, it's equally as good, especially when you have second or third uh, inter uh, form instability. So. Thank you. Um, one last one. Um, you know, it, it sounds like the nerve injury rate is rather high with um, removals many times in these cases. What's your feedback on that? Like, what is there something that uh, could be done better, or is it just sort of that's what's going to happen a decent amount of time? So, I definitely tell a patient of those of us who have um, those of us who have experience with list Franks who've seen a, a plenty of them. I've seen I've seen quite a bit of these. Uh, I've probably seen close to close to maybe even 80 or 100 of these by now, which is which is really uh, crazy to think of. These are pretty uncommon, but sometimes I've seen so many of these in a short period. Um, but uh, especially in my fellowship, there were just so many car accidents with Liz Franks. Um, so um, when I see this and, you know, you have to understand first the injury happens. So they're very well just be a nerve injury in regards to that. So the literature, you know, do they really have a, a pre-existing nerve injury that we're already making incisions for? So the soft tissue is really almost never the same, especially in high energy. So, but when we do a low energy, you know, you, you do tell a patient that, hey, there's about a 10% chance you may have some, some permanent numbness on top of your foot or even towards a second toe, um, which we, we do see. Um, and I've definitely had that. So when I do our primary arthrodesis, there's almost, I can really can't think of too many examples where patients have permanent numbness. Um, they may have temporary neuropraxia, which typically resolves with physical therapy and ambulation could be due to atrophy or just a sur normal surgery from a skin incision. But, um, uh, but yeah, um, I do tell them that there's definitely a risk of, of nerve injury uh, during surgery, or if there's a hard removal, Hey, we're going to increase this risk twofold. Um, and the foot may have some, some permanent numbness to a certain degree. Um, and it's always kind of right on the top of the foot. So it's, it's a kind of a tough area. There's not much, there's not much skin there, you know, beyond the dissection, there's, there's a different neuromuscular bundle. There is a, there is a nerve. Um, there are some tendons and that's, that's essentially it. There really is nothing else besides the skin and the bone there after that. Okay. Good deal. Uh, one last question. Uh, do you have any experience with the tight rope button type, uh, Liz Frank solution? And if so, is there, what are the benefits or downsides of those versus like a plate fusion? Uh, that, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, there's actually been, uh, plenthro ar uh, articles talking about and the endo button fixation for years, actually. Um, one, one gentleman's, uh, Jamie Kahn out of Florida, he's published numerous times, numerous times in the, that topic specifically on uh, performing, uh, endo button fixation for, uh, uh, uh for the, uh, the, the Liz Frank and then, uh, plate fixation for dorsal elevation if need be. Um, and I think they're, in my hands, I really worry about this. I've used it um, a handful of times. Every time I've used it that I run into one difficulty is that there's, with stress, um, I really do believe that it is just not enough to hold it. And if there is a need to put an intercaneiform screw or a dorsal plate to kind of prevent the elevation, we're essentially doing an ORIF. Um, and then from there, the hardware needs to come out. So when, when I, when I used to think that that was possibly a way to go based on the literature, um, I found had difficulties keeping that elevation of that second tarsal middle tarsal joint. Um, and then from there I was performing an ORIF, um, and, and to that. And I, I do believe that there's not a lot of room for percutaneous, uh, list Frank, uh, fixation. Whereas I think that, um, endo button could be really good for that, but. I just do not think there's a role for percutaneous. I think you need to open and reduce these because if you don't reduce them, 
um, the patient's never going to do well regardless of the fixation. So um, I have used it. Um, I think that I'm not sold on it, um, but the literature is out there and some of it is actually really good. Um, but I really worry about um, anything of a magnitude that involving multiple tarsal metal tarsal joints. I think it's only really indicated for um, isolated. Um, and I've seen examples where there's been multiple lists, uh, multiple uh, columns involved and they're just putting in that one device and it's really putting a lot of, a lot of strain on that area. So I just, I don't think uh, currently that is the recommended guideline and I, I worry about it. Okay. Very good. Yeah, I think that's going to conclude the presentation. Uh, Dr. Emerald, on behalf of Aragon 28 and all of our attendees, thank you very much for your presentation. Of course. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. All right, guys, have a great evening. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.